are coming on the air with people literally running into the ocean to escape deadly wildfires. Flames just tearing up t popular resort spots in Hawaii. In just the last hour, we heard from the governor and emergency officials there about why these fires are so powerful. Also breaking tonight, the alleged violent threats against President Biden and other Democrats unearthed by the FBI. All of it leading to a deadly shooting in Utah just hours before the president's trip to that state. Our team digging into the court documents. Plus, why does Jack Smith want access to Donald Trump's Twitter account? That's the big question after we're just learning tonight that the special counsel carried out a search warrant months ago that caused Twitter to pay a six-figure fine. Then, you may be in luck if you're trying to squeeze in one last trip this summer. Airfares are dropping. Just be sure you have somebody to stay with at your destination. We'll explain why. And new allegations tonight against Lizzo, with new complaints from six people who worked with her, accusing her of harassment. How fans are responding. That's later in the show. Hey, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist, in for Hallie. And tonight, we come on the air with Paradise Up in Flames. Wildfires burning out of control through some of Hawaii's most popular spots, killing six people, forcing hundreds to evacuate, leaving thousands without power, and some emergency services down. The scene is really just apocalyptic in some places. This is the, the main street through Lahaina on Maui. This time of year, it's usually packed with tourists. Now it is deserted. You can see businesses there have quite literally gone up in smoke. And this is the city's harbor. Look at this. Intense flames turning the night sky red there. It's so bad that the Coast Guard had to rescue people, a dozen people, who jumped into the water just to escape the fire. I was the last one off the dock when the firestorm came through the banyan tree and took everything with it. I want to show you this home that burned to the ground there. Ironically, nothing left but a fireplace. Tonight, some people are desperately trying to escape any way that they can. You see here, one community just decimated with flames here surrounding this woman's car as she drives away. Now, as we speak, about 2,000 travelers are stranded at Maui's airport. Hawaiian Airlines offering refunds to passengers because non-essential travel is strongly discouraged. The whole state under a red flag warning now, and that means this fire could easily get bigger, putting even more residents and more tourists in harm's way. These flames are partly fueled by strong winds caused by a Category 4 hurricane that just passed south of the islands. Let's bring in Maura Barrett now. She's tracking this story for us. It has been throughout the day. So, Maura, we just heard from state and local leaders there. Bring us up to speed. What do we know? Well, Aaron, after a major lack of connectivity, both because of no cell service and no internet, uh, no phone service at times, we haven't had a lot of information overnighted throughout the day until this update that we just got from state and local officials where they detailed that there are at least six fatalities to report, 2,100 people as of now in shelters uh, as most of the island of Maui faced these evacuation orders. I want to play you a little bit of that press conference with the lieutenant governor who's serving as acting governor right now talking about how out of the blue these fires really are. We never anticipated uh, in this state that a hurricane, which did not make impact on our islands, will cause this type of wildfires. Wildfires that wiped out communities, wildfires that wiped out businesses, wildfires that destroyed homes. Now, even as we are getting updates on evacuation orders and road closures and emergency services are uh, getting back out there and continuing to work, these fires are still very much active, at least three on the island of Maui, and they've just been rapidly spreading because of those winds from that hurricane, Aaron. You know, you talk about the difficulty getting information out of Hawaii. It's also hard to get resources into Hawaii, onto the islands there in the first place. What are some of the challenges officials and crews there are expecting or are facing as they try to contain this fire and get everybody to safety? Well, the first and most major challenge, Aaron, is that because of those winds from that hurricane, emergency helicopters, firefighting helicopters couldn't get up in the air when they needed to to start dropping water onto the flames to help contain the fire. But we did learn that they have been able to take off now and they are actively dropping water. But you also think about the other things that happen when it's incredible winds like 60 to 80 miles per hour, road closures, downed trees, down power lines. That's all been inhibiting how the firefighters and emergency 
emergency response uh, can react and work to rescue people. They've had to transfer some people to severe burn units on other islands. Uh, we've heard that commercial airlines like Hawaiian Airlines are working to help evacuate people because over on Oahu, they are hosting uh, a shelter at the convention center. Uh, one of the senators just confirmed that Chuck Schumer promised some federal resources as the state has enacted its National Guard and FEMA is working to assess the damages. But like you said, that red flag warning very much still in effect through at least when, uh, early morning, uh, early morning Thursday hours. Aaron. It is a desperate and frightening situation. Maura Barrett for us tonight. Maura, thank you. Some breaking news now out of Utah. The FBI shooting and killing a man who allegedly threatened President Biden just hours before the president's trip to that state. New court documents obtained by our investigations team saying it all played out in Provo, about 45 minutes from where the president will be tonight. The agents carried out, tried to carry out an arrest and search warrant because of these alleged threats against the president that were posted mostly on Facebook, according to court documents. The documents also say the man often wore Trump paraphernalia and threatened the FBI as well. Now, a source tells our White House team that the FBI briefed President Biden on that raid this morning. Tom Winter is joining me now to explain what happened here. Tom, it's not just the president we're talking about either. He threatened uh, allegedly several frequent targets, uh, rhetorical targets, if you will, of, of the former President Trump, too. Walk us through this. Right, Aaron. So, yes, the indictment is quite explicit. This investigation began in March of this year by the FBI uh, on reference from a social media company effectively saying, hey, there's some posts here that might be quite concerning to you all, and they're very explicit. And the indictment explicitly says that not only were the threats addressed, to your point, uh, to President Biden, but they were also addressed to D.A. Bragg as well. So they were, uh, and a number of other politicians were referenced. Uh, but basically, yes, these were focused primarily on these two individuals. They were quite explicit in their nature, the types of violence and physical things that he wanted to do. He also referenced other folks that uh, he had uh, potential issues with, as well as the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, uh, the governor of Ca California, Newsom, uh, and several other people that he, uh, that he referenced, uh, as well as Attorney General Merrick Garland, uh, calling him the Heinrich Himmler, who was, of course, the former leader of the Nazi party in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s, calling him the Heinrich Himmler of the United States. So uh, posts that were quite, uh, I think, objection, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, quite clearly uh, posts that were concerning to the FBI. Mm. All right. Tom Winter for us tonight. Tom, thank you. Sure. Some new legal documents just out a few hours ago revealing special counsel Jack Smith executed a search warrant for former President Trump's Twitter account. Now, this was part of his investigation into Trump's lies about fraud in the 2020 election. Now, that happened back in January, but we're only learning about this stuff today. Why, you might ask? Well, because the court believed disclosing the warrant to Trump would, in its words, seriously jeopardize the ongoing investigation by giving him, quote, an opportunity to destroy evidence, change patterns of behavior, or notify Confederates. All of that as the next phase of the fourth criminal investigation of the former president may finally start next week. A grand jury in Fulton County, Georgia, getting ready to hear a separate case involving Trump's election lies. Blaine Alexander has more on that from Atlanta in just a second here. Let's start, though, in Washington here with Ken Delanian. Uh, Ken, Trump hasn't tweeted, uh, we looked it up, since January 8th of 2021. Do we have a solid idea from this new filing today why the special counsel wanted a search warrant for Trump's Twitter account and, and what sort of behaviors they were worried he would change? No, Aaron, the filing doesn't specify that whatsoever. So we're left in the realm of speculation. Obviously, everyone knows that tweets are public. So we're but there are some things related to a person's Twitter account that are not public. Those would include direct messages uh, and draft tweets and potential metadata and account information. And what we know is that this was a search warrant. So Jack Smith had to convince a judge there was probable cause to believe there was evidence of a crime uh, connected to this Twitter account, and then further got an order uh, to, to gag Twitter and make sure that Mr. Trump was not aware that this was happening. Twitter, by the way, resisted this initially and was fined $350,000 by a court for doing that. But ultimately, Smith got the data, and it's not clear what he got. Uh, there's no evidence in the indictment about anything specific from Twitter. Uh, we may never know. It's a secret investigation. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, j it, it, I think what it does illustrate is that there is a lot about the special counsel investigation that happened outside of public view that remains secret to this day, Aaron.
All right, and when there's a trial, we'll see likely even more that we don't know exists right now. Uh, Ken, at the same time, there's a new hearing in the classified documents case, right? A separate case that's, that hearing is set for tomorrow. Trump is not going to be there, but what can we expect? Yeah, it's, it's a very pro forma uh, standard hearing. It's an arraignment on these new set of charges, the superseding indictment that uh, includes Mr. Trump, but also co-defendant Walt Nauta, and then uh, Mr. De Oliveira, the third newly added co-defendant. Uh, you know, we haven't been talking about that case very much lately, but it's a really extraordinary set of allegations, essentially accusing Trump of conspiring to destroy evidence that was sought under a grand jury subpoena. Really, really serious stuff, and this is the beginning of adding that part to the Florida case, Aaron. All right, Ken Delanian for us here in our Washington bureau tonight. Ken, thank you. Let's turn to Blaine Alexander now. She's in Atlanta for us today, and that's because, Blaine, I understand you've learned that we're going to have to wait until next week, likely, for the Fulton County grand jury there to, to sort of get started. Uh, help us understand where the process is right now. Well, we're watching the subpoenas, Aaron, and that's really what's giving us our best guide as to when we are going to see Afani Willis present her case to the grand jury here in Fulton County. We've got tabs on four people. We've been in touch with three of them, and we know that they've received subpoenas to basically right now be on call to testify before the Fulton Ca County grand jury anytime between now and the end of the month. Now, what's interesting is those subpoenas, which we've reviewed, uh, say that they will get a 48-hour notice before they have to actually make their way here downtown town to testify before the grand jury. You see those people right there. Uh, two of them are former state lawmakers. One of them is the former lieutenant governor and the other is a reporter. All of them kind of factor into Fonnie Willis's investigation as far as the scope that we know of what she's investigating. So two of the former lawmakers, for example, were inside this uh, panel. They witnessed this presentation that was made by Rudy Giuliani back in 2020, uh, where he espoused a number of since debunked uh, claims about election fraud here in Georgia. So they're going to testify on that. So that kind of gives us, one, a glimpse into what exactly she's going to be taking to a grand jury, but also the timing. The fact that two of them told us this morning they've not received their 48 hours notice lets us know that the case is not going to be presented this week, most likely. So we're looking at next week. So when you look at the timing, when you look at the fact that Bonnie Willis has said that she plans to have her charging decisions done before September 1st, when she has blocked out this kind of three-week period uh, during which we're going to see heightened security, during which the majority of her office will be working from home. We know that next week is the last week of that period. So certainly that's going to be the week that we're focusing on uh, to, to watch and see when she's going to be presenting this case and what sort of decision we would get from that grand jury, Aaron. All right. Blaine Alexander for us in Atlanta tonight. Blaine, thank you. Appreciate it. The State Department saying tonight it welcomes reports that an American nurse and her child are now safe after being kidnapped in Haiti almost two weeks ago. Uh, we express our deepest appreciation to our Haitian and U.S. interagency partners for their assistance in facilitating for their uh, their safe release. And out of respect for their privacy, we'll let the individual speak okay. for them, well, th themselves when they feel ready. Earlier today, a nonprofit group connected to this woman and her daughter announced that with a, quote, heart of gratitude and immense joy, their prayers are answered. Now, according to the organization, this uh, this woman, a Alex Dorsonville, was serving in the community ministry when the two were taken late last month. This case sparked international attention, as you might imagine, prompting protests really across the region. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren is joining us now to talk us through what uh, has developed here. Kristen, what more do we know about this really positive development? Right. Hey there, Aaron. Well, this is the news that really everyone had been waiting for uh, after this woman, this young nurse and her young daughter uh, were taken. They were missing for 11 days in an interview with The New York Times. Her mom uh, said she hasn't spoken with Alex yet, but that uh, she was released last night. The organization El Roy that she was working with, with her Haitian-born husband, uh, said there is still much to process and to heal from the situation. So we are asking that no attempts be made to contact Alex or her family at this time. And you heard the State Department there saying as well that it was going to wait uh, to let Alex and her husband, her family speak if they so choose. But really, the news that everybody is waiting for, has been waiting for, that they are safe uh, and back with family members. Aaron? 
Uh, Kristen, I want to back up a little bit if we can here. This kidnapping happened the same day that the State Department ordered non-essential, non-emergency government employees uh, and their families to leave Haiti, right? What more do we know about what's, what drove that warning? Right. And so, you know, Haiti has been um, in, in control of gangs, really, and that they are getting more aggressive. These kidnappings have been happening mostly for ransom, uh, to the point where UNICEF released a report this week that said 300 children and women uh, had been kidnapped in the first half of this year, and those numbers continue to rise. And so a very dangerous situation. The United Nations has called for a multinational force to step in. The U U.S. is in support of that and has said uh, that it would uh, put forward a resolution in the Security Council. Kenya has said that it would volunteer its force. Uh, it's still unclear what the U.S. contribution to that force would be, um, and that is likely going to come down to this report that's due in the United Nations next week. So the United States waiting to see what that looks like as Kenya explores what its options are going to be. But, uh, you know, the United United Nations really looking for the rest of the world to step in and restore some type of order to Haiti. Aaron. All right, Kristen Dahlgren with us tonight. Kristen, thank you. You bet. California Senator Dianne Feinstein is back at home tonight after a fall at her home on Tuesday, sent her to the hospital. Now, her office says that she was in the hospital for about two hours as a precaution, but was released when her, quote, scans were clear. It's just the latest health scare for the 90-year-old senator who has faced calls to resign over claims that she's not fit to serve after she was hospitalized with shingles back in February. She was absent from the Senate for about three months, forcing the Judiciary Committee to hit pause on some key appointments. Feinstein has uh, re rejected calls that she stepped down, saying she'll serve until her term is up. That's in January of 2025. NBC's Sahil Kapoor joins me now. Uh, Sahil, this fall is... is Sort of a reminder, the latest one, of the senator's age here. Do we have an understanding of, you know, once uh, Senate, the Senate is back in session, that they're going to have a conversation about the aging Senate in general? We know that more than half of them are 65 or over 65. Or is this simply one that might lead to more calls for this senator to step down? Aaron, I would not expect that conversation to happen within the Senate. This is a body that is very protective of its members. And uh, none of the members of the Senate have called on Dianne Feinstein to resign. Uh, none of them have called on other senators who have uh, demonstrable health issues to resign. But, you know, perhaps you might see some calls from Democrats outside the chamber. Feinstein, for her part, her office tells me that she briefly went to the hospital yesterday after what they called a minor fall. They say all her scans were clear and she returned home uh, a spokesperson said that hospital visit lasted only two hours. And uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, the Democratic majority leader, says, let's put up a statement here. Quote, I spoke with Senator Feinstein this morning. She said she suffered no injuries and briefly went to the hospital as a precaution. I'm glad she is back home now and is doing well. Unquote. This is not the first health instance involving Senator Feinstein. Let's show what she's dealt with so far this year. She was hospitalized in February with shingles and missed about three months of work in the Senate. That was a around when the calls to resign began. Then in May, she was uh, diagnosed with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, or, or at least revealed it then, and uh, now in August, this minor fall at home. In terms of the Senate, I can count to at least five senators in their 80s. One of them, Chuck Grassley, is knocking on the door of 90 and just got reelected to a six-year term, uh, which would take him to the age of 95. So there's not a whole lot of desire among senators, you know, to, to step down as a, as a result of age. Feinstein is leaving the Senate at the end of her 2024, uh, at the end of the calendar year 2024, and there is a pretty heated battle on the Democratic side in the safe blue state of California to try to succeed her. Let's show the graphic of the candidates. The main ones are Adam Schiff, uh, Katie Porter, and Barbara Lee. So far, Adam Schiff, you can see there, has a massive fundraising advantage. Some see him as the favorite, although it's far from uh, a done deal uh, at this point. Aaron? All right, Sahil Kapoor for, Sahil Kapoor for us uh, at his post on Capitol Hill. Sahil, thank you. A new historic launch from Virgin Galactic set to happen tomorrow. It's going to be the first with a crew of civilians. Virgin Galactic set to lift off from its, uh, first, on its space, first space tourism flight. On board that flight, an 80-year-old former Olympian with Parkinson's disease and a mother with her 18-year-old daughter. It's the same ship that sent Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson and his crew to space two years ago. Here's Gotti Schwartz. 
It's a final day before launch, and there is a lot of work to do. Just a little while ago, we saw the pilots of this spacecraft going up. They were pulling all kinds of high G maneuvers in these small acrobatic planes, uh, simulating what they're going to be doing tomorrow in a spacecraft exactly like this when they take three civilians, people like you and me, a mom, uh, her daughter, as well as an 80-year-old Olympian up into space. And all week, they have been preparing them for that mission to space, simulating uh, things like getting their seatbelt off so they could walk around and float up in space in that zero gravity, putting their seatbelt on, what it's like to hit uh, Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, and all hoping for a re-entry tomorrow, right around uh, 10 o'clock, 10.30, safely here on the ground. All of this is part of that dream from Richard Branson, not just to go up into space, but to open space up for so many more humans. And that's something that we could see happen a lot more often here in the New Mexico desert. They're saying once a month, and then pretty soon, one flight like this a week. Back to you. Well, relief may be in sight for air travelers, with new data showing airfares starting to go down over the next few weeks and into the fall. That's after high demand and overall higher operating costs made it a pretty expensive summer travel season, both domestically and internationally. The flight booking app Hopper says domestic fares are down 11 percent from this time last year, and fares to Europe are down slightly, 2 percent. And while airfares may be dropping, your hotel stay is not going down. U.S. hotels are 11 percent higher than a year ago still down from summer highs of more than $200 per night. Tom Costello was looking into all this for us. So, Tom, you know, airfares we know are sort of seasonal, right? Summertime, things tend to be more expensive. They kind of cool off as we go to that uh, yeah. fall time with back to school. What else is sort of contributing to the, the drop in air prices? Listen, to be clear, we're really talking about what's going to be happening going forward, Aaron. So the airfare numbers you just gave, that's going to be over the coming weeks and into mm -hmm. the fall. Not really now, but what's what we're looking for going ahead. And the bottom line is, if you can travel in the fall, yes, it looks like prices are falling. And here's why. We've got added capacity. What does that mean? It means more airline seats on critical U.S. routes, domestic routes. Uh, and we've seen a lower uh, jet fuel price helping out as well. Increased competition. More airlines are flying right now, offering more seats. And then we are seeing travel shifting to global international getaways. So as a result, more people wanting to go international. That means fewer people are traveling domestically. So that is why we're starting to see domestic airfares for going forward into the fall starting to drop international uh, yeah, they're dropping, too, but they're still pricey. Can I give you a couple here? Domestic mm -hmm. airfares for the fall, we're talking round trip, $257. Not bad, really, round trip. Yeah. That's uh, about down 11% in one year. International, all right, hold on to your seat, Aaron. Uh, they exploded this summer. This fall, they're coming down, but still up 7% going to Europe. That's since 2019, 813 bucks round trip. And Asia, holy free holies, up 59%. <laughs> In Asia, $1,400 is the average round trip. Yeah, yeah, I went to Spain this summer, so I know, I know the pain of the, the traveling to Europe uh, these days. But as you, you talk about looking down the road, right, we're looking into the future. Do we have an idea of how long the lower airfares might last? I know the holiday season is going to be up uh, in, front, in front of us before you know it. Yeah, so for those of us who know who the kids are out of the house now, so we don't yeah. we're not we're no longer stuck to the school schedules. The, this is the shoulder season, right? The fall is the shoulder season. That's a great time to fly because prices do come down. So prices are expected to remain lower up until Thanksgiving and then they pop up again over Thanksgiving. You have a quiet couple of weeks early December and then they pop up again. This is already the time. I hate to say that when it's hot outside. This is the time to start researching Thanksgiving and December airfares. And if you see that you can lock in a schedule and a pretty decent fare, don't expect it's going to get better. That doesn't happen. Likely it's only going to get more expensive. Yeah, so many people like to watch the fair thinking maybe, oh, it'll go down if I try again tomorrow. This is not the time to use that strategy, obviously. Well, just think about, yeah. can I just make the point, uh, virtually every plane I've been on this year is packed. Virtually every one. And that's going to continue. So, no, don't expect the airlines are going to be desperate to sell seats. They know their planes are going to be packed. They can keep charging good rates. Yeah, smart. All right, Tom Costello for us tonight. Tom, we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. You bet. You bet. Coming up, the American woman accused of plotting to kill her husband in the Bahamas appearing in court today. What police are revealing now about this case. Plus, 
Target is facing a new lawsuit tonight. We'll tell you why that is. That's coming up in our five things. Stick around. So there is a subtle but kind of significant change coming to your iPhone. We'll explain that coming up in our five things. First, though, a major win for reproductive rights supporters as Ohio voters overwhelmingly rejected a ballot measure in a special election. Now, this would have raised the threshold needed to amend the state's constitution from a simple majority to 60 percent. Voters turned out in record-breaking numbers, really, with 56.7 percent rejecting the measure and 43.3 percent voting to support it. Now, this sets the stage for an even bigger abortion fight in November. That's when voters will decide, by a simple majority, whether to guarantee abortion access in the state's constitution. Ali Vitale is in Ohio for us tonight. Aaron, the latest flashpoint in the abortion battle across the United States, ending in a victory for abortion advocates here yesterday in Ohio. We were talking about this as a proxy battle because, of course, when voters went to the polls yesterday, nothing on their ballot said anything explicitly about abortion. But it was clear to voters on both sides of this ballot initiative that the attempts Republicans were making to raise the threshold of what it would take to actually change their state constitution were very much connected with abortion access. That's because Republicans knew what was coming down the calendar. In November, Ohio voters will go to the polls to vote on an amendment that would enshrine the right to abortion protections into the Ohio state constitution. Yesterday's election was an attempt to make that harder, and it failed. I think this is something that's important for us to take into the larger picture of the post-Dobbs landscape, the aftermath of the Supreme Court overturning the Roe versus Wade pre precedent from the Supreme Court that previously protected a right to abortion care. We've seen across the country in red states like Kansas and purple states like Michigan and certainly across the board in the 2022 elections, the midterms, how abortion was such a salient issue. Ohio now, the latest data point in that, as Democrats and abortion advocates see this as an issue with staying power. And look, with more than three million people turning out to vote, you can understand why this is supposed to be an election in August, dog days of summer, Republicans popped this up last minute. Many people were expecting turnout to be low. Clearly, that wasn't the case. And clearly, the energy was on the team that wants to see more abortion access in this state, despite the fact that it typically goes red in a presidential year. Aaron. All right, let's turn now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a huge explosion at a factory outside Moscow hurt dozens of people this morning. That blast happened in a pyrotechnics warehouse that officials say may have been violating safety requirements. The explosion shattered nearby windows and hurt at least 56 people. The specific cause is still unclear, but Russian officials are blaming a, quote, human factor. Number two, an American woman accused of plotting to kill her husband in the Bahamas has been released on bond. Lindsay Shiver is charged along with her alleged lover, as well as a third man, uh, with conspiring to kill her husband after he filed for divorce. Shiver can't leave the Bahamas. She was fitted with an ankle monitor, and she has to report to the police three times a week. Number three, a conservative legal group is suing Target on behalf of one of its investors. This after backlash over the retailer's LGBTQ plus themed merchandise. The lawsuit says Target did not warn its investors of the possible risks to its stock price. Number four, a big change coming to your iPhone in the new software update, iOS 17. That little red end call button that you use to hang up the phone when you make a call. Well, apparently it's moving about a half an inch to the right. Now, it may not sound like a big change, but if you're an iPhone user, it may take a beat to get used to that shift to the right. Because you kind of do things blindly, right? It's just supposed to be where it's supposed to be all the time. Number five, in L.A. tonight, it's the end of an era's tour, at least in the U.S. Taylor Swift plays her last show here in the States before she sets off around the world. And with the summer of Swift coming to a close, the impacts are pretty huge. California says the six-night run of the concerts there has added $320 million to L.A. County's GDP. The Eras Tour returns to the U.S. in the fall of 2024. All right, when we come back, one of our reporters going one-on-one -on -one with Colorado's Democratic governor, why he is splitting with his party on immigration. That's next in tonight's Newsmaker segment.
We come back with some sad news to report tonight. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer for the band, Robbie Robertson, has died. Robertson was the songwriter behind some of the band's biggest hits, chart toppers like The Wait and The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. Rolling Stone put the Canadian rock legend on its list of the greatest guitarists who ever lived. Robertson also worked on soundtracks for some of Martin Scorsese's biggest movies, the director calling him a confidant and a collaborator. Robbie Robertson was 80 years old. We turn to Colorado now, where a new law barring anyone under 21 from buying a gun was just blocked by a federal judge. It was signed this spring by Governor Jared Polis, a rising star in the Democratic Party who has had the, to choose his battles in that purple state. The first openly gay man elected governor in this country, he's also earned respect from conservatives by supporting religious freedoms. He wants to slash carbon emissions as well, but also wants stronger borders. Not exactly typical there, and neither is the venue where he met up with NBC's Noah Pransky for tonight's Newsmaker. I love my team, I love the Rockies, but I also love the game. Do you love the game of politics as much? Uh, it's not, I, I like more the results from politics. I'm, baseball has a lot of unwritten rules of civility that people play by, and I think that we need more of that civility between opposing teams in our political system too. Now batting, Jared Polis, governor of Colorado. A lifelong baseball fan with a few thoughts about the red team and the blue team in Washington. So how do you feel about people treating politics more and more like a sport? That's a shame, because uh, sports has its place, but politics should be about more than just the game. Why are we even in a batting cage? Okay, we're going to crank it up. Let's well, baseball is about the only thing Polis says he misses about his 10 years in the U.S. House. I'm the all-time RBI leader for congressional baseball team, which they keep the statistics on. And a 400 hitter. Oh, I see you did your research. The Polis path to prominence began in college with a series of e-commerce startups that later sold for more than a billion dollars. His first political job was on the Colorado Board of Education. He served 10 years in Congress, then became the first openly gay man ever elected governor in U.S. history. He's also become one of the most popular ones by largely avoiding the culture wars and with initiatives that play well in both urban and rural Colorado. Property and income tax cuts, free pre-K and all-day kindergarten, expanded solar, wind, and geothermal power, and creating an official office of saving people money on health care. Last year, Polis was re-elected by a whopping 19.3 points. He also recently launched, alongside Utah's Republican Governor Spencer Cox, a national campaign for civility. Please join us in showing America the right kind of conflict. Together, we can disagree better. What's the strategy to disagree better when you have growing camps on each side that are growing more extreme? So governors like Spencer Cox and myself can't fix it all, but as leaders, I think we have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to govern in a unifying way, to be a role model rather than a cause of this division. We're in an era where LGBTQ rights are under attack. The Supreme Court is moving further to the right. Is this a time for disagreeing better and compromise or a time for a fight? Well, you know, it's a time for all of those things. I mean, there's no, there's no shame in disagreeing. Our nation was built on profound disagreements. And what's happening now, which is alarming, is that on both sides, people are debating caricatures of the other side rather than what the other side actually believes. And they're frankly questioning the motives or the even Americanism of the other side. Another topic Polis is trying to triangulate is immigration. He wants the Biden administration to better secure the southern border, but also to grant work permits to the undocumented immigrants already in the United States. Well, right now we have a labor shortage in Colorado, two job openings for every unemployed person. We also have tens of thousands of people here who are underemployed because they don't have the right status. We have the jobs open, let them work, let them support themselves rather than taxpayers support them. Polis admits life isn't perfect in Colorado. He has a lot of work to do on addressing the state's housing shortage. But he has no doubt his previously purple state will stay blue again in 2024 if Donald Trump is again the Republican nominee. If he's not, well, then Polis says it is possible the state could go red for the first time in 20 years. Not for, I don't think, Donald Trump, but for others who might be running if they're able to prevail in the Republican primary. Of course, that's a possibility. So as a Democrat, if, if Biden is the nominee, is the biggest concern that it's someone other than Trump? You know, as, as, as a Democrat, we hope that Donald Trump's the nominee, but as American, we hope that Donald Trump's not the nominee. So I, 
as an American, obviously, country above party, hope that it's somebody else. There's been chatter that Polis could be that someone else for Democrats, too. Would you ever consider going back to D.C. for the right job? Not, not really. I really like, you like being in Colorado, and we're raising our two kids here, and I did my 10 years there, and, you know, I'm not so... Uh, Self-righteous is to think that somehow I have the solution for what ails D.C. I really don't. I hope that we can do it together. And he's hoping to do it without having to throw too many political bombs. He'd much rather be hitting bombs. And Noah Pransky joins me now. So, Noah, you talked to Polis about President Biden's strategy to deal with inflation, too, the economic fallout from the pandemic. Uh, what was the governor's take on, on the so-called Bidenomics? He generally supports the president's economic plans. He supports the Inflation Reduction Act, although he did question why it's called that. He said it's great for investing in infrastructure and clean energy, renewables, but it isn't really addressing inflation the way he'd like. He wants to see the Biden administration do a couple of things. And this is where he can kind of sometimes sound like an old school Republican. He says, I want to see uh, immigration addressed to close the borders and issue those work permits. It will help address the employment and the labor issue in America. The other thing is he says he wants more free trade. He wants to roll back those Trump tariffs that the Biden administration has left in place so far. He says those two things alone would take a huge chunk out of inflation. Aaron. All right. Noah Pransky with us tonight. We appreciate it, Noah. Thank sure. you. Well, coming up, a troubling sign in China. Why officials there say youth unemployment is rising. We're talking about it with our reporter live in Beijing. Plus, a new ruling tonight in the Gilgo Beach serial murders. What a judge is ordering the suspect to do. That's next. So officials in Texas say a woman was attacked by a snake and then was sort of saved by a hawk. We're going to tell you what happened. That's a little bit later in the local. First, though... We want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. New inflation data out from China today with prices dropping in July for the first time in two years. Now, that may sound like a good thing to those of us paying higher prices, but the concern is that the country is struggling, lacking consumer demand. And it's just the latest economic data that's raising eyebrows about China's weak post-COVID recovery. The job market in that country is also looking pretty bleak right now, especially for young people. NBC's Janice Mackey Frere explains. These are tough days in China for many who are young, looking for work and just not finding it. This is a job fair on the outskirts of Beijing. The positions up for grabs here are mostly in sales or insurance. This year's job market has been difficult for newcomers, says Zhang Bo, who's 22 and just graduated from university along with more than 11 million other people. Part of what's driving record youth unemployment here. It hit 21.3% in June. That's one in five young people between the ages of 16 and 24, and four times the overall jobless rate in China. Meng Zhou has been looking for four months, and he isn't hopeful. I don't know how to answer that, he says, but I'll keep looking. The gloomy prospects have young people seeking solace in online chat groups and, it seems, at temples where they are literally praying for luck. According to Trip.com, a travel booking platform here, temple visits across China are up 360 percent this year, roughly half the visitors born after 1990. I'm wishing for more career luck, says this woman. Everyone is stressed out and competitive at school, she told us. Everyone is tired. The lack of jobs here goes deeper than the numbers. It's more structural. The jobs eluding most highly educated workers weren't lost from the economy, per se. They've never existed. Back at the job fair, Ms. Bai is a recruiter. She talked about an imbalance on the hiring side, too, in that skills aren't matching needs. She has one position to fill with a moving company. And it's not just young people feeling the impact of a slowing post-COVID economy here, with big tech companies like Alibaba making deep cuts. Middle-aged and older workers are losing jobs and finding it hard to compete with young people who will work more for less. A phenomenon known as the curse of 35, now making the rounds on Chinese social media, saying that getting hired past the age of 35 is nearly impossible because companies think those employees are less likely to work overtime. It's gotten so bad, Chinese state media is even acknowledging it, 
with the Workers' Daily newspaper devoting an editorial to ending age discrimination. Liu Guo Rong and her husband are both 60. People in their 40s have to support the elderly and raise children, she says. There are knock-on effects of these labor shifts, too. As unemployment has climbed, the number of marriage license applications hit a new low. Property sales and spending have slowed. There are even some parents now paying their kids to be full-time children, mostly to do housework and be available when needed as people wait or pray for better days. And Janice joins me now from Beijing. Janice, uh, you mentioned in the piece there these, these structural changes to the economy, right? How, how uh, You talked about how highly educated graduates are looking for jobs that never really existed. So why is it being felt so much now? Aaron, the, the plan was for China's economy to transform from labor-intensive industry to a more high-tech, skills-service-oriented uh, economy, and that's still in transition. Uh, there are a lot of manufacturing jobs. China figures that half of them are going to go unfilled over the next couple of years because young graduates don't want factory jobs. So there's this misalignment between the supply of highly educated, skilled workers and demand for them. The economy essentially hasn't caught up. There's also some reading into the numbers that we need to do. The unemployment rate here is a measure of people actively seeking work, not like the U.S. where it's a reflection of people available for work. Add to this the issue of underemployment. You know, by Chinese metrics, if you work one hour a week, you're considered employed. So if we apply that measure, probably another quarter of college graduates are underemployed. There's one economist at Peking University who figures with all of these other factors, plus the number of young people who just aren't bothering to look for work anymore, the youth unemployment rate could actually be as high as 46.5%. So the headline is striking in itself, but there's a lot at play with these numbers. Aaron? Yeah, and as you watch what happens in China, it stands to reason that you could start to see some of these things happening in other places around the world, including here in the States. Uh, interesting uh, story. We really appreciate you bringing it to us. Janice Mackey Fair in Beijing for us tonight. Thank you. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, today a judge said that the Gilgo Beach murder suspect has to submit to a cheek swab for DNA testing. His lawyers argued against it, but the judge said it'll be helpful to see whether it matches evidence collected. There's no set date for when he has to give that sample. Out of our Southern Bureau, now this is kind of a crazy catch, right? The mayor of uh, Tampa, Florida, was fishing off the Florida Keys and found 70 pounds of cocaine floating in the ocean. Officials said it's worth more than a million dollars. Also from our Southern Bureau, this is not your typical arm injury. Follow me on this. A snake dropped from the sky onto a woman in Texas who was mowing the lawn. It wrapped itself around her arm. And if that wasn't bad enough, a hawk then swooped down to try to get the snake. I didn't make that up. This all actually happened, or at least she says it did. Eventually, the hawk ripped the snake off of the woman. She was treated at the hospital, says she feels lucky to have survived this cartoon quality incident, but it happened in the real world. So there you go. Still to come, the potentially record-setting Mega Millions jackpot just won in Florida. What we're learning about whether that winner actually has to come forward. Well, tonight we have a winner, one lucky ticket in Florida, winning the Mega Millions lottery. It was sold at a Publix grocery store. The prize, a potential record $1.58 billion. Now, this was the first ticket to match all six numbers in almost four months, so the prize just kept growing in that time. Before taxes, the winner is looking at a lump sum of $783.3 million. Guad Venegas, joining me now from Neptune Beach, Florida, uh, near that store, Guad, you're standing outside where the winning ticket was sold. What are you hearing there? Will we ever know who the lucky winner is? 
Oh, well, Aaron, I've been talking to customers that arrived here today. They all knew that the winning ticket was sold at this store. A lot of them telling me that they had purchased tickets themselves, but uh, obviously were not uh, the lucky winners. So uh, the state of Florida uh, has a law that says that the winner cannot remain anonymous. Some states allow winners to remain anonymous, not the state of Florida. You can see the list of all the different states that would allow you not to disclose your name if you win the lottery. Now, what the winner can do in the state of Florida is request that their identity isn't shared for 90 days after they claim the prize. So at the very least, we would know in 90 days, maybe 90 days from today, if the winner has already claimed the prize. Uh, so we spoke with a lot of people that came who were surprised that the winning ticket was sold here and very excited to hear the news. Here's one of them. Oh, I went immediately. I went looking for the tickets. So, but yeah. Uh, I'm happy because it's a local person. Um, hopefully, they will spend the money wisely. Now, judging from the geography uh, geography here, this uh, store is in the northern part of Neptune Beach. Atlantic Beach is right here. So a lot of people I've spoken to say that the people that shop at this store are either from Atlantic Beach or Neptune Beach. So perhaps the member of a community here or there are the person he or she who won the prize, Aaron. You know, I'm, I'm curious too, Guad. I know Florida doesn't tax lottery winnings. So what do the experts, the money experts, recommend for folks if, if they win the lottery there? Taking the lump sum, spreading it out over time, what's the deal? Aaron, it's crazy how we've all been talking about the money, right, as if we won the lottery, thinking about <laughs> what would I do with the money. I, I did contact the, uh, an expert, a finance expert that I've worked with in the past, and I asked him, what would you do if you won all that money? And he said, well, the first thing would be to separate the sum of the money that I would use in the near future to obviously enjoy the fact that I won the lottery. <laughs> But most of it I'd set aside and he said, I would call an expert myself. There are companies out there, wealth management companies, finance experts that work with banks who can give someone advice to how to invest the money. Now, there's so many different options that the expert told me he would need an expert. So it would be advised for the individual to get that type of advice from a wealth management company who can tell them how to best invest the money. So that's the advice for anyone that could come up on a couple hundred million dollars if they are the next winner or if the winner is watching us right now, Aaron. Yeah, makes good sense. I thought you were going to say separate yourself from all the people who might want some of that money. But the, the, the advice you got makes a lot more sense. I get it. All right, go out, go out Vanegas for us in Florida tonight. Thank you, go out. That is a wrap for this hour. Our coverage picks up right now. We are coming on the air with literally people running into the ocean to escape deadly wildfires. Flames are just tearing up popular tourist spots in Hawaii. In just the last hour, we heard from the governor and emergency officials there about why these fires are so powerful. And breaking tonight, the alleged violent threats against President Biden and other Democrats unearthed by the FBI. All of it leading to a deadly shooting in Utah just hours before the president's trip to that state. Our team digging into the court documents for you. Plus, why does Jack Smith want access to Donald Trump's Twitter account? That's the big question after we're just learning tonight that the special counsel carried out a search warrant months ago that caused Twitter to pay a six-figure fine. And new allegations tonight against Lizzo with new complaints from six people who worked with her accusing her of harassment. How fans are responding, that's later in the show. And Virgin Galactic is getting into the space tourism game. We are live from New Mexico, hours before the big launch there. That's coming up. You want to stick around for that. Hey, everybody, I'm Aaron Gilchrist, in for Hallie. And tonight we come on the air with Paradise Up in Flames. Wildfires burning out of control through some, through some of Hawaii's most popular spots, killing six people, forcing hundreds to evacuate, leaving thousands without power, and even some emergency services are down. The scene is just apocalyptic in so many instances. This is the main street in Lahaina on Maui. This time of year, it's usually packed with tourists. Now it is deserted. You can see businesses there have quite literally gone up in smoke. And this is the city's harbor. Look at this, intense flames turning the night sky red there. It's so bad, the Coast Guard had to rescue a dozen people who jumped into the water just to escape the fire. I was the last one off the dock when the firestorm came through the banyan tree and took everything with it. 
Oh, just hard to imagine. Take a look at this. This home burned to the ground there. Ironically, nothing left but a fireplace. Tonight, people are desperately trying to escape any way that they can. You can see here one community just decimated by flames with uh, the flames surrounding the woman's car as she tries to drive away here. Now, as we speak, 2,000 travelers are stranded at Maui's airport. Hawaiian Airlines offering refunds to passengers because non-essential travel is strongly discouraged. The whole state is under a red flag warning. Now, that means this fire could easily get bigger, putting even more residents and more tourists in harm's way. These flames are partly fueled by strong wind caused by a Category 4 hurricane that passed just south of the islands. Maura Barrett has more. So, Maura, we just heard from state and local leaders there. Bring us up to speed. What do we know? Well, Aaron, after a major lack of connectivity, both because of no cell service and no internet, uh, no phone service at times, we haven't had a lot of information overnighted throughout the day until this update that we just got from state and local officials where they detailed that there are at least six fatalities to report 2,100 people as of now in shelters uh, as most of the island of Maui faced these evacuation orders. I want to play you a little bit of that press conference with the lieutenant governor who's serving as acting governor right now talking about how out of the blue these fires really are. We never anticipated uh, in this state that a hurricane, which did not make impact on our islands, will cause this type of wildfires. Wildfires that wiped out communities, wildfires that wiped out businesses, wildfires that destroyed homes. Now, even as we are getting updates on evacuation orders and road closures and emergency services are uh, getting back out there and continuing to work, these fires are still very much active, at least three on the island of Maui. And they've just been rapidly spreading because of those winds from that hurricane, Aaron. You know, you talk about the difficulty getting information out of Hawaii. It's also hard to get resources into Hawaii, onto the islands there in the first place. What are some of the challenges officials and crews there are expecting or are facing as they try to contain this fire and get everybody to safety? Well, the first and most major challenge, Aaron, is that because of those winds from that hurricane, emergency helicopters, firefighting helicopters couldn't get up in the air when they needed to to start dropping water onto the flames to help contain the fire. That We did learn that they have been able to take off now and they are actively dropping water. But you also think about the other things that happen when it's incredible winds like 60 to 80 miles per hour, road closures, downed trees, down power lines. That's all been inhibiting how the firefighters and emergency response uh, can react and work to rescue people. They've had to transfer some people to severe burn units on other islands. Uh, we've heard that commercial airlines like Hawaiian Airlines are working to help evacuate people because over on Oahu, they are hosting uh, a shelter at the convention center. Uh, one of the senators just confirmed that Chuck Schumer promised some federal resources as the state has enacted its National Guard and FEMA is working to assess the damages. But like you said, that red flag warning very much still in effect through at least when, er, uh, early morning. Uh, early morning Thursday hours. Aaron. It is a desperate and frightening situation. Maura Barrett for us tonight. Maura, thank you. And some more breaking news, this time out of Utah. The FBI shooting and killing a man who allegedly threatened President Biden just hours before the president's trip to that state. New court documents obtained by our investigations team saying it all played out in Provo, Utah. That's about 45 minutes from where the president will be tonight. The agents carried out, uh, tried to carry out an arrest and search warrant there because of these alleged threats against the president that were posted mostly on Facebook. This is according to court documents. The documents also say the man often wore Trump paraphernalia and threatened the FBI as well. Now, a source tells our White House team that the FBI briefed President Biden on the raid this morning. Ken Delanian is joining me now. So, Ken, it's not just President Biden here. The man who was killed was also accused of threatening several frequent targets of former President Trump's rhetoric, right? Walk us through what you know. That's right, Aaron, including uh, the New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg and the Vice President Kamala Harris. In fact, uh, he allegedly posted on social media, the time is right for a presidential assassination or two, first Joe, then Kamala. And that, of course, led the FBI to seek an arrest against Craig D. Robinson of Provo, Utah. And when they tried to do that this morning, they ended up shooting him to death. We don't have the exact details on what went down in that altercation, but they say that he was the owner of a sniper rifle and a ghillie suit. That's kind of a camouflage suit that military snipers wear, that he had Nazi paraphernalia 
Um, he also made reference to the California governor, uh, Gavin Newsom. He, he was approximately 70 to 75 years old, uh, and he was observed with an AR-style rifle. So a really difficult situation, uh, uh, threats to multiple public officials. FBI tried to take action, ends up shooting and killing this subject. You know, Ken, some of this just sort of seems like the world that we live in now in the last few years. This is this is happening at a time when threats against officials are seemingly on the rise, right? Yeah, that's right. Just a few days ago, uh, a group that examines uh, domestic violence took account of all the federal cases involving threats of public officials over the last five years, and they counted more than 500, and there's been a spike in the last year in particular. And that's just federal cases. We know anecdotally that, and, and I know from talking to my law enforcement sources, this behavior is on the rise. People are very concerned. There's a lot of violent rhetoric in the air, and some small portion of society is acting on it and threatening public officials, Aaron. All right, our intelligence and justice correspondent, Ken Delaney, in today. Ken, thank you. You bet. New legal documents just out a few hours ago revealing special counsel Jack Smith executed a search warrant for former President Trump's Twitter account. Now, this was part of his investigation into Trump's lies about the fraud in the 2020 election. Now, this happened back in January, but we're only learning about it today. Why? Well, because the court believed disclosing the warrant to Trump would, in its words, seriously jeopardize the ongoing investigation by giving him Again, quote, an opportunity to destroy evidence, change patterns of behavior, or notify Confederates. All of that as the next phase of the fourth criminal investigation of the former president may finally start next week. A grand jury in Fulton County, Georgia, getting ready to hear a separate case involving Trump's election lies. Blaine Alexander has more on that from Atlanta for us in just a second here. But let's start with uh, Garrett Hake here in D.C. with us. Garrett uh, the filing is not clear about what the special counsel is looking for necessarily, but we know that Trump hasn't tweeted since, what, January 8th of 2021. So what else is there to look at here? Aaron, the reality here is we simply don't know exactly what it was that the special counsel was interested about Mr. Trump's Twitter habits leading up to January 6th. As you pointed out, the account was shut down on January 8th. But, it, you know, what's not public about your Twitter account, same as anybody out there watching, would be things like drafts or direct messages, activity that was basically handled on the account but not published. So what did Mr. Trump or his, you know, allies who handled the account for him write on his behalf that he didn't send either on the 6th or or after the election. That may be the kind of thing that the special counsel was trying to get at. But either way, it appears Donald Trump found out about this for the first time today, too. He posted on Truth Social, his new platform, really attacking this whole effort. He said that the FBI, the, uh, the DOJ had attacked his Twitter account, that it was a hit on his civil rights, even arguing about whether or not the First Amendment exists here. Um, that's been kind of right in line with the way he's been talking about this issue in general, that his, his ability to speak, his ability to have political opinions has somehow been hampered by these investigations and now this prosecution into him. And Garrett, this, this filing also reveals a pretty hefty fine for, for Elon Musk, for Twitter, right? Yeah, this is interesting. Basically, what we find here is Twitter, or X as it's now called, uh, resisted handing over this information to prosecutors for a little while because of this non-disclosure element to, the, to their warrant, saying that if they handed it over, they also couldn't tell Donald Trump that they were handing it over. And those fines built over a period of several days up into $350,000, which the uh, warrant application points out is not a lot of money for uh, Elon Musk, but is still kind of a big deal and I think indicative of the way that uh, the new Twitter now X is handling these kinds of requests uh, from law enforcement. And meanwhile, Garrett, there is a, a new hearing in the classified documents case that's happening tomorrow, right? I know Trump's not going to be there, but what can we expect? Yeah, these are the arraignments for the other two defendants on the superseding indictment that came out more than a week ago now in the classified documents case. Remember, Donald Trump's attorneys have already filed saying he's not going to show up to change his plea. He's still pleading not guilty. He doesn't need to be there. Uh, but Walt Nauta, his original co-defendant, does plan to attend. And Carlos de Oliveira, who has not yet been arraigned because he couldn't find a local lawyer in Florida, has to be there, uh, presumably to enter his plea. Uh, but again, this is sort of pro forma part of the process here. But it's getting dragged out in the way that we have seen sort of consistent with the Trump strategy here to delay, delay, delay even the most basic elements of uh, how these cases move forward. 
All right, Garrett Haig here in our Washington bureau tonight. Garrett, thank you. Let's turn to Georgia now. Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta for us. Uh, and Blaine, I understand you're learning that we're going to have to wait until next week for the Fulton County Grand Jury to sort of get started in this case. Uh, help us understand where the process is right now. That's when we're expecting that presentation to take place, Aaron, for the district attorney here in uh, Fulton County to present her case to the grand jury. Now, we know that because we're watching the subpoenas. That really is our best kind of timeline as to when we could see this case present and when we could potentially see indictments. So we know that already uh, Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis is certainly gearing up to present her case into election interference to a grand jury. We know that because subpoenas have gone out. She's already put people on notice that she wants them to come down to downtown Atlanta, stand before a grand jury and testify. But what's interesting is that we reviewed one of those subpoenas. It really only puts people on call. That's kind of how the subpoena is phrasing it. So saying that they need to be available sometime between now and the end of the month to come down here. But as they get closer, they're going to get a 48 hour heads up to say, OK, get ready. You're going to have to come on this date within the next 48 hours. I spoke with two people who've received those subpoenas. I spoke with them, and as of this morning, they have not gotten that 48-hour heads up. So what that tells us is that in all likelihood, the DA is not going to be presenting her case this week. It's instead going to go to next week. Now, remember, uh, Fonnie Willis has already given us a pretty strong time bracket, an indication of when she would make this presentation. It's going to be before September 1st. She says it's going to wrap up by then. But also, she's uh, put the courthouse, put the sheriff's office, other officials on high alert that between July 31st and August 18th, she's going to want extra security around the courthouse. We see it right now with these orange barricades. We know that even just inside the municipal court, for example, has gone to virtual hearings because of the uh, impact around the courthouse. So when we talk about security, we know that that kind of timeline ends at the end of next week. So that certainly gives us a strong indication of what we're looking at time-wise. The other thing, Aaron, I think is important to talk about is security. You know very well, our viewers know very well what's at stake when we talk about this investigation. We're talking about a potential fourth indictment for the former president. The DA has made no secret about the fact that she's gotten a number of threats. So that's why you see increased security and we'll likely see that security continue to increase in the days ahead, Aaron. All right, Blaine Alexander for us in Atlanta tonight. Blaine, thank you. The State Department saying tonight it welcomes reports that an American nurse and her child are now safe after being kidnapped in Haiti almost two weeks ago. Uh, we express our deepest appreciation to our Haitian and U.S. interagency partners for their assistance in facilitating for their, uh, their safe release and out of respect for their privacy, we'll let the individual speak okay. for them, well, th themselves when they feel ready. Now, earlier today, a nonprofit group connected to this woman and her daughter announced that with a, quote, heart of gratitude and immense joy, their prayers are answered. According to the organization, Alex Dorsonville will ser will, was serving in the community ministry when the two were taken late last month. The case sparked international attention, prompting protests across that region. Kristen Dahlgren joins me now. Kristen, what more do we know about this really positive development? Right. Hey there, Aaron. Well, this is the news that really everyone had been waiting for uh, after this woman, this young nurse and her young daughter uh, were taken. They were missing for 11 days in an interview with The New York Times. Her mom uh, said she hasn't spoken with Alex yet, but that uh, she was released last night. The organization El Roy that she was working with, with her Haitian-born husband, uh, said there is still much to process and to heal from the situation. So we are asking that no attempts be made to contact Alex or her family at this time. And you heard the State Department there saying as well that it was going to wait uh, to let Alex and her husband, her family speak if they so choose. But really, the news that everybody is waiting for, has been waiting for, that they are safe uh, and back with family members. Aaron? So, Kristen, I want to back up a little bit if we can here. This kidnapping happened the same day that the State Department ordered non-essential, non-emergency government employees uh, and their families to leave Haiti, right? What more do we know about what's, what drove that warning? Right. And so, you know, Haiti has been um, 
in, in control of gangs, really, and that they are getting more aggressive. These kidnappings have been happening mostly for ransom, uh, to the point where UNICEF released a report this week that said 300 children and women uh, had been kidnapped in the first half of this year, and those numbers continue to rise. And so a very dangerous situation. The United Nations has called for a multinational force to step in. The U U.S. is in support of that and has said uh, that it would uh, put forward a resolution in the Security Council. Kenya has said that it would volunteer its force. Uh, it's still unclear what the U.S. contribution to that force would be, um, and that is likely going to come down to this report that's due in the United Nations next week. So the United States waiting to see what that looks like as Kenya explores what its options are going to be. But, uh, you know, the United Nations really looking for the rest of the world to step in and restore some type of order to Haiti. Aaron. All right, Kristen Dahlgren with us tonight. Kristen, thank you. You bet. California Senator Dianne Feinstein back at home tonight after a fall at her home on Tuesday sent her to the hospital. Her office says she was in the hospital for about two hours just as a precaution, but was released when her, quote, scans were clear. Now, it's just the latest health scare for the 90-year-old senator who has faced calls to resign over claims she's not fit to serve after she was hospitalized with shingles back in February. She was absent from the Senate for about three months, forcing the Judiciary Committee to hit pause on some key appointments. Feinstein has rejected calls to step down, saying she will serve until her term is up in January of 2025. It's all happening as we're finding out that, her, that Feinstein named her daughter as her attorney in fact, legal speak for giving somebody the power of attorney over their affairs. NBC's Sahil Kapoor joining me now from Capitol Hill. Sahil, this fall, uh, this is just the, the latest reminder of the senator's age to some people. Do you see any indications that once the Senate's back in session, there's going to be a conversation at all about the aging Senate where we know more than half of them are over 65 years old? Or is this likely something that would lead to more calls for the senator to step down? Well, outside the Senate, there certainly will be that conversation, Aaron. Inside the Senate, I would not hold my breath. Members tend to be very protective of their colleagues when it comes to issues of age and health. This is, after all, a very old Senate, as you pointed out. I can count to, uh, five senators who are in their 80s, and one of them, uh, Chuck Grassley, is knocking on the door of 90, just got reelected to a six-year term that would take him all the way to 95. Uh, so Senator Feinstein has given no indication that she's going to step down. Her office says this was simply a minor fall on the hospital hospital visit was, in their words, precautionary. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has issued a statement uh, defending or at least supporting Senator Feinstein, saying, quote, and let's put this up. He says, I spoke with Senator Feinstein this morning. She said she suffered no injuries and briefly went to the hospital as a precaution. I'm glad she is back home now and is doing well, unquote. As you mentioned, uh, this is the latest of several health issues that Feinstein has faced just this year. In February, uh, she was hospitalized with what we later learned to be shingles and missed several months of work. That was around the time the calls to resign uh, began over that period. In May, we learned that she had been diagnosed with Ramsey Hunt syndrome. And uh, here just yesterday, uh, we learned that she had that fall at home. Her term is set to expire at the end of 2024. She has said she will step down then. There is currently a pretty heated battle among Democrats to try to replace her uh, in the safe blue state of California. Three House Democrats in particular are vying for that seat. Adam Schiff currently leads uh, that pack. Let's show the, the fundraising numbers. Adam Schiff leads the pack in terms of uh, money with 30 million. There's Katie Porter after that. And then Barbara Lee, uh, a, a distance behind in terms of fundraising. I want to ask you about this other news we're getting to, Sahil, this uh, attorney in fact that has been named uh, the senator's daughter. Most people think of power of attorney as being for somebody who isn't able to speak for themselves to some degree in legal matters. Uh, explain to us what you've been able to, to understand about what's happening here. Yeah, it's hard to know the exact reasons for why uh, Senator Feinstein's daughter, Catherine Feinstein, was given this power. It's not unusual for this to happen. There are a whole host of reasons for why it would happen, you know, and certainly some people can speculate that uh, Feinstein's age uh, of 90 years old and her health matters have led her to make this decision. It also comes as there's been, uh, you know, a quite a messy spat going on between Feinstein and her daughter, Catherine Feinstein, on one side. 
uh, and the children of Feinstein's late husband, Richard Blum, uh, over the over Richard Blum's estate. He was a, a financier, and his children seemed to be at odds with uh, uh, Senator Feinstein and her daughter about how to proceed here. Uh, also, you know, raising questions about why, uh, you know, there is this power of attorney granted by a sitting U.S. senator. That's according to a recent story in the New York Times. But Feinstein's office says it's a private matter. They're not commenting on it. All right, Sahel Kapoor for us up on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Well, relief may be in sight for air travelers with new data showing airfares starting to go down over the next few weeks and into and through the fall. That's after high demand and overall higher operating costs made it an expensive summer for travel, both domestically and internationally. The flight booking app Hopper, it says domestic fares are down 11 percent from this time last year and fares to Europe are down slightly, 2 percent. And while airfares may be dropping, your hotel stay is not going to get any cheaper. U.S. hotel prices are 11 percent higher than a year ago, but down from summer highs of more than $200 per night. Tom Costello joins us now. So, Tom, you know, airfares we know are sort of seasonal, right? Summertime, things tend to be more expensive. They kind of cool off as we go to that uh, yeah. fall time with back to school. What else is sort of contributing to the, the drop in air prices? Listen, to be clear, we're really talking about what's going to be happening going forward, Aaron. So the airfare numbers you just gave, that's going to be over the coming weeks and into mm -hmm. the fall. Not really now, but what's what we're looking for going ahead. And the bottom line is, if you can travel in the fall, yes, it looks like prices are falling. And here's why. We've got added capacity. What does that mean? It means more airline seats on critical U.S. routes, domestic routes. Uh, and we've seen a lower uh, jet fuel price helping out as well. Increased competition. More airlines are flying right now, offering more seats. And then we are seeing travel shifting to global international getaways. So as a result, more people wanting to go international. That means fewer people are traveling domestically. So that is why we're starting to see domestic airfares for going forward into the fall starting to drop international uh, yeah, they're dropping, too, but they're still pricey. Can I give you a couple here? Domestic mm -hmm. airfares for the fall, we're talking round trip, $257. Not bad, really, round trip. That's uh, about down 11% in one year. International, all right, hold on to your seat, Aaron. Uh, they exploded this summer. This fall, they're coming down, but still up 7% going to Europe. That's since 2019, 813 bucks round trip. And Asia, holy free holies, up 59%. <laughs> In Asia, $1,400 is the average round trip. Yeah, yeah, I went to Spain this summer, so I know, uh, I know the pain of the, the traveling to Europe uh, these days. But as you, you talk about looking down the road, right, we're looking into the future. Do we have an idea of how long the lower airfares might last? I know the holiday season is going to be up uh, in, front, in front of us before you know it. Yeah, so for those of us who know who the kids are out of the house now, so we don't yeah. we're not we're no longer stuck to the school schedules. The, this is the shoulder season, right? The fall is the shoulder season. That's a great time to fly because prices do come down. So prices are expected to remain lower up until Thanksgiving, and then they pop up again over Thanksgiving. You have a quiet couple of weeks early December, and then they pop up again. This is already the time, I hate to say that when it's hot outside, this is the time to start researching Thanksgiving and December airfares. And if you see that you can lock in a schedule and a pretty decent fare, don't expect it's going to get better. That doesn't happen. Likely, it's only going to get more expensive. Yeah, so many people like to watch the fair thinking maybe, oh, it'll go down if I try again tomorrow. This is not the time to use that strategy, obviously. Well, just think about, yeah. can I just make the point, uh, virtually every plane I've been on this year is packed. Virtually every one. And that's going to continue. So, no, don't expect the airlines are going to be desperate to sell seats. They know their planes are going to be packed. They can keep charging good rates. Yeah, smart. All right, Tom Costello for us tonight. Tom, we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. You bet. You bet. The American woman accused of plotting to kill her husband in the Bahamas appearing in court today. What police are now revealing about that case? Plus, why a new study says some popular heartburn medications may increase your risk of dementia. That's coming up in our five things. Stay with us. Well, let's get you to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Robbie Robertson, frontman of the band, died today after a long illness, according to his publicist. He was the lead singer and guitarist of an ensemble that started out as a Bob Dylan's uh, as Bob Dylan's backup group and eventually struck out on their own. Robertson was 80 years old. 
Number two, an American woman accused of plotting to kill her husband in the Bahamas has been released on bond. Lindsay Shiver is charged, along with her alleged lover, as well as a third person, with conspiring to kill her husband after he filed for divorce. Shiver can't leave the Bahamas. She was fitted with an ankle monitor, and she has to report to the police three times a week. Number three, a new study says that people who take certain acid reflux drugs for more than four and a half years may be at a higher risk for dementia. Now, they looked at people over 45 who took proton pump inhibitors long term and found they had a 33% higher risk of developing dementia than those who didn't. Number four, a former NFL player for the Las Vegas Raiders had, was just sentenced to at least three years in prison for a fatal drunk driving crash. Henry Ruggs III pleaded guilty to driving 156 miles per hour while drunk and then slamming into another car. That crash, killing a 23-year-old woman and her dog, he'll be eligible for parole after three years. Number five, a big change coming to your iPhone in the new software update, iOS 17, that red end call button you use to hang up a phone call. Well, it's moving about a half an inch to the right. Now, that may not sound like a big change, but if you're uh, an iPhone user who maybe doesn't like things to move a whole lot, it may take a beat to get used to that shift to the right. When we come back, a major win tonight for abortion rights in Ohio. We're looking at what it could mean for November. Plus, one of our reporters going one on one with Colorado's Democratic governor, why he's splitting with his party on immigration. That's next in tonight's Newsmaker segment. A major win for reproductive rights supporters as Ohio voters overwhelmingly rejected a ballot measure in a special election. Now, it would have raised the threshold needed to amend the state constitution from a simple majority to 60 percent. Voters turned out in record-breaking numbers, 56 percent of them, 56.7 percent, rejecting the measure and 43.3 percent voting to support it. Now, this sets the stage for an even bigger abortion fight in November. That's when voters will decide by a simple majority whether to guarantee abortion access in the state constitution. Ali Vitali is in Ohio for us tonight. Aaron, the latest flashpoint in the abortion battle across the United States, ending in a victory for abortion advocates here yesterday in Ohio. We were talking about this as a proxy battle because, of course, when voters went to the polls yesterday, nothing on their ballot said anything explicitly about abortion. But it was clear to voters on both sides of this ballot initiative that the attempts Republicans were making to raise the threshold of what it would take to actually change their state constitution were very much connected with abortion access. That's because Republicans knew what was coming down the calendar. In November, Ohio voters will go to the polls to vote on an amendment that would enshrine the right to abortion protections into the Ohio state constitution. Yesterday's election was an attempt to make that harder, and it failed. I think this is something that's important for us to take into the larger picture of the post-Dobbs landscape, the aftermath of the Supreme Court overturning the Roe versus Wade pre precedent from the Supreme Court that previously protected a right to abortion care, we've seen across the country in red states like Kansas and purple states like Michigan, and certainly across the board in the 2022 elections, the midterms, how abortion was such a salient issue. Ohio now, the latest data point in that, as Democrats and abortion advocates see this as an issue with staying power. And look, with more than three million people turning out to vote, you can understand why this is supposed to be an election in August, dog days of summer, Republicans popped this up last minute. Many people were expecting turnout to be low. Clearly, that wasn't the case. And clearly, the energy was on the team that wants to see more abortion access in this state, despite the fact that it typically goes red in a presidential year. Aaron. Our thanks to Ali Vitali there. We turn to Colorado now, where a new law barring anyone under 21 from buying a gun was just blocked by a federal judge. Now, this was signed this spring by Governor Jared Polis, a rising star in the Democratic Party who's had to choose his battles in that purple state. The first openly gay man elected governor in the U.S. He is also one who's earned the respect of conservatives by supporting religious freedoms. He wants to slash carbon emissions, but also wants stronger borders. Not exactly typical here, and neither is the venue where he met up with NBC's Noah Pransky for tonight's Newsmaker interview. <laughs> I love my team, I love the Rockies, but I also love the game. Do you love the game of politics as much? Uh, 
It's not, I, I like more the results from politics. I'm, baseball has a lot of unwritten rules of civility that people play by, and I think that we need more of that civility between opposing teams in our political system, too. Now batting, Jared Polis, governor of Colorado. A lifelong baseball fan with a few thoughts about the red team and the blue team in Washington. So how do you feel about people treating politics more and more like a sport? That's a shame because uh, sports has its place, but politics should be about more than just the game. Why are we even in a batting cage? Okay, we're going to crank it up. Let's well, baseball is about the only thing Polis says he misses about his 10 years in the U.S. House. I'm the all-time RBI leader for congressional baseball team, which they keep the statistics on. And a 400 hitter. Oh, I see you did your research. The Polis path to prominence began in college with a series of e-commerce startups that later sold for more than a billion dollars. His first political job was on the Colorado Board of Education. He served 10 years in Congress, then became the first openly gay man ever elected to governor in U.S. history. He's also become one of the most popular ones by largely avoiding the culture wars and with initiatives that play well in both urban and rural Colorado. Property and income tax cuts, free pre-K and all-day kindergarten, expanded solar, wind, and geothermal power, and creating an official office of saving people money on health care. Last year, Polis was re-elected by a whopping 19.3 points. He also recently launched, alongside Utah's Republican Governor Spencer Cox, a national campaign for civility. Please join us in showing America the right kind of conflict. Together, we can disagree better. What's the strategy to disagree better when you have growing camps on each side that are growing more extreme? So governors like Spencer Cox and myself can't fix it all, but as leaders, I think we have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to govern in a unifying way, to be a role model rather than a cause of this division. We're in an era where LGBTQ rights are under attack. The Supreme Court is moving further to the right. Is this a time for disagreeing better and compromise or a time for a fight? Well, you know, it's a time for all of those things. I mean, there's no, there's no shame in disagreeing. Our nation was built on profound disagreements. And what's happening now, which is alarming, is that on both sides, people are debating caricatures of the other side rather than what the other side actually believes. And they're frankly questioning the motives or the even Americanism of the other side. Another topic Polis is trying to triangulate is immigration. He wants the Biden administration to better secure the southern border, but also to grant work permits to the undocumented immigrants already in the United States. Well, right now we have a labor shortage in Colorado, two job openings for every unemployed person. We also have tens of thousands of people here who are underemployed because they don't have the right status. We have the jobs open, let them work, let them support themselves rather than taxpayers support them. Polis admits life isn't perfect in Colorado. He has a lot of work to do on addressing the state's housing shortage. But he has no doubt his previously purple state will stay blue again in 2024 if Donald Trump is again the Republican nominee. If he's not, well, then Polis says it is possible the state could go red for the first time in 20 years. Not for, I don't think, Donald Trump, but for others who might be running if they're able to prevail in the Republican primary. Of course, that's a possibility. So as a Democrat, if, if Biden is the nominee, is the biggest concern that it's someone other than Trump? You know, as, as, as a Democrat, we hope that Donald Trump's the nominee, but as an American, we hope that Donald Trump's not the nominee. So I, as an American, obviously, country above party, hope that it's somebody else. There's been chatter that Polis could be that someone else for Democrats, too. Would you ever consider going back to D.C. for the right job? Not, not really. I really like, you like being in Colorado, and we're raising our two kids here, and I did my 10 years there, and, you know, I'm not so... Uh, self-righteous is to think that somehow I have the solution for what ails DC. I really don't. I hope that we can do it together. And he's hoping to do it without having to throw too many political bombs. He'd much rather be hitting bombs. And Noah Pransky joins me now. So Noah, I know you talked to Polis about President Biden's strategy to deal with inflation in particular, the, the economic fallout from the pandemic too. Uh, what was the governor's take on this so-called Bidenomics? He generally supports the president's initiatives and he supports the massive investment in clean energy and infrastructure. But he did kind of sound a little bit like a Republican at times when he was questioning whether the Inflation Reduction Act actually was doing much for inflation. He says the investment is great, but if the Biden administration wants to take a bigger hack out of inflation, there's two things he wants to see them do. One is roll back the Trump tariffs, with the Biden, which the Biden administration has not really done in their uh, 
uh, years in D.C. so far. And the other is address immigration, because he says being better at the border and issuing work perm permits will address inflation much faster than some of these other initiatives. All right. Noah Pransky with us tonight. Noah, appreciate it. Good to see you. Sure, you too. Coming up, a troubling sign in China. Why officials there say youth unemployment is rising. We're talking about it with our reporter live in Beijing. Plus, why more than 100 soccer fans were arrested in Greece. That's later in The Global. Now we want to bring you tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. New inflation data out of China today with prices dropping in July for the first time in two years. Now that may sound good to those of us paying higher prices, but the concern is that the country is struggling, lacking consumer demand. And it's just the latest economic data that's raising eyebrows about China's weak post-COVID recovery. The job market in that country also looking bleak, especially for young people. Janice Mackey Frere explains. These are tough days in China for many who are young, looking for work and just not finding it. This is a job fair on the outskirts of Beijing. The positions up for grabs here are mostly in sales or insurance. This year's job market has been difficult for newcomers, says Zhang Bo, who's 22 and just graduated from university along with more than 11 million other people. Part of what's driving record youth unemployment here. It hit 21.3% in June. That's one in five young people between the ages of 16 and 24, and four times the overall jobless rate in China. Meng Zhou has been looking for four months, and he isn't hopeful. I don't know how to answer that, he says, but I'll keep looking. The gloomy prospects have young people seeking solace in online chat groups and, it seems, at temples where they are literally praying for luck. According to Trip.com, a travel booking platform here, temple visits across China are up 360 percent this year. Roughly half the visitors born after 1990. I'm wishing for more career luck, says this woman. Everyone is stressed out and competitive at school, she told us. Everyone is tired. The lack of jobs here goes deeper than the numbers. It's more structural. The jobs eluding most highly educated workers weren't lost from the economy per se. They've never existed. Back at the job fair, Ms. Bai is a recruiter. She talked about an imbalance on the hiring side, too, in that skills aren't matching needs. She has one position to fill with a moving company. And it's not just young people feeling the impact of a slowing post-COVID economy here, with big tech companies like Alibaba making deep cuts. Middle-aged and older workers are losing jobs and finding it hard to compete with young people who will work more for less. A phenomenon known as the curse of 35, now making the rounds on Chinese social media, saying that getting hired past the age of 35 is nearly impossible because companies think those employees are less likely to work overtime. It's gotten so bad, Chinese state media is even acknowledging it, with the Workers' Daily newspaper devoting an editorial to ending age discrimination. Liu Guorong and her husband are both 60. People in their 40s have to support the elderly and raise children, she says. There are knock-on effects of these labor shifts, too. As unemployment has climbed, the number of marriage license applications hit a new low. Property sales and spending have slowed. There are even some parents now paying their kids to be full-time children, mostly to do housework and be available when needed as people wait or pray for better days. And Janice joins me now from Beijing. Janice, uh, you mentioned in the piece there these, these structural changes to the economy, right? How, how, uh, you talked about how highly educated graduates are looking for jobs that never really existed. So why is it being felt so much now? Aaron, the, the plan was for China's economy to transform from labor-intensive industry to a more high-tech, skills-service-oriented uh, economy, and that's still in transition. Uh, there are a lot of manufacturing jobs. China figures that half of them are going to go unfilled over the next couple of years because young graduates don't want factory jobs. So there's this misalignment between the supply of highly educated, skilled workers and demand for them. The economy essentially 
really hasn't caught up. There's also some reading into the numbers that we need to do. The unemployment rate here is a measure of people actively seeking work, not like the U.S. where it's a reflection of people available for work. Add to this the issue of underemployment. You know, by Chinese metrics, if you work one hour a week, you're considered employed. So if we apply that measure, probably another quarter of college graduates are underemployed. There's one economist at Peking University who figures with all of these other factors, plus the number of young people who just aren't bothering to look for work anymore, the youth unemployment rate could actually be as high as 46.5%. So the headline is striking in itself, but there's a lot at play with these numbers. Aaron? Yeah, and as you watch what happens in China, it stands to reason that you could start to see some of these things happening in other places around the world, including here in the States. Uh, interesting uh, story. We really appreciate you bringing it to us. Janice Mackey Frere in Beijing for us tonight. Thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our foreign desk has done it for you. We call this segment The Global. From Greece, more than 100 arrested soccer fans were in court today after violent clashes killed one person and hurt dozens. Now, the fights happened Monday night, a day before rival Greek and Croatian club teams were supposed to play each other. Officials say makeshift explosives, stones, and flares were being thrown. The match is postponed until next week. Out of Norway, a dam partially burst because of heavy rain and flooding. At least 1,000 people live in that area, but officials say they were all evacuated before the dam gave way. This all comes as Norway is dealing with the worst recorded flooding in 50 years. And from China, have you ever seen a white raccoon? Uh-oh. A rare cub with light-colored fur was born in a zoo in China. A shock to the uh, zookeepers there. The odds of this type of raccoon being born, only one in 750,000. Zookeepers say the health and habits of this cub are no different from the type of raccoon that we might expect to see. And the other raccoons are getting along just fine with it. Still to come, one space flight set to make history tomorrow. We are talking about it with Gotti Schwartz live from the launch site. That's coming up next. Stick around. A historic launch from Virgin Galactic is set for tomorrow. This is going to be the first launch with a crew of civilians. This is Virgin Galactic's first space tourism flight, if you will, on board an 80-year-old former Olympian with Parkinson's disease and this mother and her 18-year-old daughter. This is the same ship that sent Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson and his crew to space. That was about two years ago. Gotti Schwartz joining me now from the launch site in New Mexico, where he's been getting the lay of the land here. So, Gotti, talk to us about what's happening, what the preparations have been like for this big flight. Well, it is T-minus one day and counting. There is so much excitement out here. Today was actually a day of relaxation for the astronauts. And remember, when we say astronauts, we mean civilian astronauts, Aaron. Civilians like you and I, that means that, yes, there is a possibility that we may someday get into a spaceship uh, like this one. This one's a replica, but it basically shows uh, the exact same setup that these astronauts are going to be getting into uh, tomorrow. They're going to climb inside uh, this rocket Right behind me, uh, the, the rocket that's going to be on this spaceship pushes 70,000 pounds of thrust going Mach 3, breaking the sound barrier all the way up into space. They get up there, zero gravity. They float above or actually below Earth, depending on the orientation, because at some point the spaceship goes inverted and they're able to see the Earth above them. Uh, we were running a simulator just a little while ago, and this is just a, an example of how mind-altering this is. They ran me through the simulation, Aaron, and then at one point I tell the, the pilot instructor next to me, I'm like, oh, look, the Earth is above us. And he says, there is no up or down. <laughs> blew my mind because when you think about it there is no up or down and that's just one of those crazy experiences that they're going to uh feel up there in space then they'll come down and and, and we'll have a big celebration aaron yeah pretty cool for them to be able to get to experience that and i, and I know Gotti. part of the idea here is that eventually more people will get to experience this so when you think about richard branson being in the game here what does this mean for this space tourism market that's emerging when you have Branson and Virgin Galactic uh, in the game now, in the mix. 
Uh, well, the big question is like, is this even profitable? We rolled up here. We've seen them taking them out in acrobatic planes. I mean, it's not just one flight that they go up and then come down. These are world class pilots that they employ. There is an entire infrastructure. I'm from New Mexico. I used to work in Albuquerque as a local reporter. And I remember coming out here with a, a camera and shooting that area over there and thinking this is a total pipe dream. There is no way they're going to be able to pull this off. Well, now we are starting to see more regular flights and get this after this flight they're going to try to do monthly flights after that they're going to try to do one flight a week so we are finally starting to see uh, this yeah. entire industry take off in a big way Aaron pretty cool pretty cool Gotti thank you so much and for more on this story from Gotti tune in tonight for his show live from the Virgin Galactic launch site in New Mexico that's at 8 p.m. Eastern 5 Pacific on NBC News now top story picks up coverage right now Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.